Hello and good morning, everyone, whether you are new here or have been joining us uh, seminar after seminar since we first launched uh, this online training program. Welcome and thank you for being here. I hope you're having a terrific start to the new year. Uh, today we have an incredible panel of ultralight enthusiasts and the session will be moderated by Ted Rankin, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but I'd like to walk you through a few uh, um, back end information that you would like to know before we get started officially. So new year, new seminar series, um, mostly same sponsors. We have a new title sponsor, Zolio, who we'd love to introduce to you uh, in a few short upcoming seminars. Uh, we have Pole Employee Benefits, Sirius XM, Tannis Aircraft Products, and of course, Forflight, who have been with us since the very first, uh, uh, since the very beginning of our seminar series. So the agenda to today is quite simple. This is part two of a two-part series. Uh, right now I'm offering you, of course, the introduction to the event itself. The panel will be between 60 to 90 minutes and it will be recorded. So um, keep that in mind if, if you have any issues with needing to get in and out. But if you are intending to get the pilot or current training um, uh, for yourself, you have to watch part one and part two fully. And how you can record that is to put it in your log book. Blog book. You'll put parts one, the date that you actually watched it, uh, and all the information there. Today, you'll complete that uh, that recording with the information you see on your screen right now. Seminar name, transitioning to ultralights, ultra easy part two. Uh, and we'll, we'll just put the instructor names as Ted and Kathy Lubitz uh, with COPE with COPA and today's date. So I will copy and paste that into the chat shortly after this, um, through periodically throughout the seminar, of course. So uh, no need to uh, hurry and track that down. I'll, I, I've got your back there. Of course, we want you to ask as many questions as possible. We want you to feel at home uh, and we try to make it as such. So ask your questions, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from today, and we will be monitoring the chat throughout, but you're, you're also able to uh, interact with other COPA members and other pilots across the country as well. And we may not get to every question. It is a Q&A panel discussion or uh, a hangar talk, however you want to look at it. Uh, we'll try to get to every single one. If we can't get to them, um, we'll just send us an email after if, if they're still burning questions and we'll endeavor to answer those. Um, what else should I mention here? We will make the, the recording available in a few short days. So if you have a friend who was unable to make it and they're itching to know when it will be released. Uh, it'll be in a, in a couple of days. Okay. Now, uh, I'm very excited to also share with you that we have new aviation scholarships that have just launched. So in the spirit of aviation, of course, we want to open doors for others and, and ensure that uh, they, they get the same opportunity. So we have over nearly 25,000 in scholarship opportunities available. Uh, it supports those who are pursuing their private pilot's license, advanced training. So maybe you're looking for a float rating, um, commercial uh, pilot license, whatever you name it, there are three awards available valued at 2,500 each. And I should say for the Ab Initio Award, there is one award available for um, a value of up to 14,000. That is for an individual between 16 and 21. The intention there is to uh, support young, young pilots. And then we have a, a new um, scholarship, the COPA RPAS Pilot Scholarship that awards three individuals to pursue their advanced RPAS certification. So we're very excited about that and we hope you can share this opportunity with your network and, and encourage them to apply. Applications are due March 1st. I would get on it if they are interested as there is, um, there is a requirement to provide a, a letter of recommendation as well. And last uh, mention here, sorry about my slippery hands, the uh, aircraft insurance incentive. Many of you who've been here before, you've heard about it, but uh, just simply attending our sessions, you do get an insurance incentive, um, accident forgiveness with Magnus if you are part of our VIP program. So I'll leave that there for the updates that I have um, from COPA. And I'll, I'll now invite everybody who's on our panel to turn on their cameras, smile and wave to our, our big crowd here. Um, 
I myself am joining from Ottawa. I see I see Ted, and Kathy, and Bill, Derek, and and Kathy Montgomery. Um, Ted Ted Rankin, who is our moderator, and and I have the pleasure to introduce him. Um, Ted wears many many hats. Uh, for us, he's also the, the mastermind behind the Smart Pilot series in collaboration with Casera, uh, of course, the Civil Aviation Search and Rescue uh, Association. And so why is that important? Smart Pilot is a lot of, uh, has created a lot of safety content that we've used for our safety seminars in 2021. So uh, a lot of that good training, it, it came from Ted. So Ted, I'd, I'd love for you to add more to your background so others can learn more about where you come from, where you are, and, and your joy for aviation. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, yes, as Sharon mentioned, Ted Rankin, um, Smart Pilot, and um, I'm uh, I, I'm also I really am a pilot. I don't just play one on on video. I've been flying for um, wow fifty years now, um, all sorts of aircraft, and still actively flying with both general aviation and um, and ultralights. Sharon mentioned Smart Pilot, and I really appreciate that. We created that about seven or eight years ago in partnership with Casera, and um, we've been pretty excited. Uh, pretty pretty excited about it. Um, uh, of course, where I, I'm focused on safety, so I want to make sure we start with um, some uh, health and safety first. So uh, I'd like you to look around and see where the closest exit is from where you're sitting and identify where your closest washrooms are before we dive into the program. <laughs> I also want to talk about Casera, if I might, for just a moment. Of course, you know, they are the Civil Air Search and Rescue Association of Canada. And they've got over 1,500 um, plus volunteers organized into 13 groups. A group is in each province and territory, and they're standing by 365 days a year to assist in providing um, search and rescue services to, um, to the Canadian Air Force. Um, they are the group behind not just the website, smartpilot.ca, but we've also created a series of seminars. And this particular one on transitioning has been done in partnership with, uh, with UPAC. Um, Kathy Lubitz is president. She's on our panel. And the reason I do want to dwell a bit on Casera and mention them is because they're celebrating 35 years of service of volunteers in this country. And they've been here for a long time to help um, save lives and uh, create innovation to be able to keep uh, to keep people flying safer, better. And then they're there just in case that uh, just in case that they're ever needed. So enough about me. I'd like to talk a little bit um, on our panel and um, in no particular order. Um, well, actually, in a particular order, because we are talking ultralights, what I'd like to do is um, introduce Kathy Lubitz, if I could, who will give her a little bit of a background on who she is and who UPAC is, if you don't already know. OK, um, thank you, Ted. Um, you had a little bit of my background um, on the introduction to the seminar from COPA. Um, private pilot license. We built home builds way back before ultralights. <clears throat> and then we discovered ultralights when they came out. I guess it was mid 1990s when we got involved. So I'm an ultralight instructor. Um, we have schools, bright aviation. But more importantly, uh, I want to talk about UPAC. It's um, an organization for ultralight pilots um, and light airplanes and grassroots flying. That doesn't mean we're restricted to ultralight pilots because many, many of our members also have other licenses, including airline ratings and stuff. So there's there's a wide variety of um, information available and context and context uh, in UPAC. Um, we're mainly interested in the lightweight grassroots um, flying and we're more into education rather than regulation. And appears transports um, current focus on the general aviation safety program they're on board with that because their safety program and particularly their ultralight working group are all about education um, i'm not sure there's a will to change regulations at this point if they even could because there's a backlog of years to get anything through and COVID has certainly complicated that with their focus being on the airlines and covid people covid status coming into canada Anyway, um, I guess that's it for now. And uh, I turn it back over to Ted. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, so while we're on the Kathy's, this is not exactly <laughs> Kathy squared here because one's a K and one's a C, but Kathy Montgomery, could you give us a little bit about your background? Oh, Kathy's quiet here, we're on mute.
give it a try, Kathy. We seem to, we, we're, we don't quite have your audio there. Give it a, okay. So what maybe you might need to do, you might need to reboot. Um, like, and what I'll do is if you don't mind, I'm going to, uh, I'll move on to Derek and we'll wait for you to rejoin. See you in a few moments. Okay. So Derek, uh, you're up next here. All right. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, Derek Magushak here. I, um, I am ultra light instructor as well. I, uh, I run a flight training unit at uh, Lucan airport, CPS four, and we speci specialize in paragliders and powered paragliders. Um, buying paragliders in 1996 in Poland, uh, where I was uh, born and raised, and I'm uh, flying paraglider, uh, power paraglider to um, I guess that's everything for now. Uh, thank you for having me today, and uh, you can find me by going to paragliding.ca. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, another member of our panel for today is Bill Bryan, well-known certainly in uh, Ontario. And Bill, why don't you give us a little bit of a, your background? Well, I started uh, uh, flying in uh, late 1999. Um, I started at Toronto Aerosport, which I am now the chief pilot, uh, chief instructor, flight instructor for Toronto Aerosport. I have approximately 5,000 hours of flying, and I've flown uh, many different types of ultralights. So uh, it's been 19 years of having a good time. Back to you, Ted. If there's a bit of a lag on this, I'm I'm actually I'm controlling the master panel here to for everyone to know, <laughs> and I'm also watching the chat. I can I'm astonished to see where people have come from. We're from coast to coast to coast, and um, even someone down from Port Canaveral. And I see Kathy has just joined the room. Let's see if. Uh, her audio is going. Kathy, is your are you, is your audio working? Can you give us a bit of a background? I'm hoping it is. You is are. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Perfect. Um, so is the uh, have the others finished? Then would you like? Yeah, you're up. Okay. All right. So I'm an ultralight instructor. Um, been uh, have been since well about 23 years. Uh, based out of Peterborough, I uh, train only on uh, weight shift ultralight, the trikes. Um, I started uh, really just uh, went for a flight with someone at Peterborough and just thoroughly enjoyed it. I really don't have any interest in flying anything else. Um, interestingly, I've, I've trained a, a lot of people, transitioned a lot of people, whether it's from commercial airlines, hang gliders, powered paragliders. And um, I really uh, look forward to your questions, whether it be about the aircraft you're going to buy, uh, some of the lessons I've learned transitioning people uh, or general questions about what you hope to do with your aircraft. So uh, that's about, about it for me. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kathy. So I see we've got some questions that are already starting in our question panel, and we also invited you to um, pose questions as well um, online in advance. So we're going to make sure we get to um, as many questions as we can, but we will be working as well with the ones we received online because those that took a little bit of extra energy to go forward. And the, I think the very first one that strikes to um, something that came up in the in our video and uh, actually someone caught it and it wasn't like we put a, this in there to make sure you're paying attention, but there was a question and, uh, about, um, although we make a definition to say, well, look at, we call, um, we made a point of making uh, uh, the termination or the term for um, ultralight um, airplane. Airplanes are not aircraft. And Kathy, you are certainly the person that knows all the nuances of that. So what's the reason that we went from airplane and why is it airplane? and Why did we interchange? Okay. Legally, uh, according to Transport Canada, the definition for an ultralight is an ultralight aeroplane, which means, um, well, it means various things. But then we turned around and changed in the conversation the way we really talk about it. We talk about aircraft. We talk about planes. We talk about fun flyers. We talk about flying machines. So we just got into conversational as opposed to legal uh, distinctions. Um, it does matter in the regulations. Um, some of the cars in part four particularly, which is um, training and licensing, aircraft apply to everything. And the word aeroplane does not apply to ultralights. So back to the fact that it's a legal distinction, um, but we're not going into those weeds right now. So we just 
transferred into common verbiage, whatever. <laughs> in my case, after flying GA for 50 years, old habits die hard. End up calling yeah. <laughs> um, end up calling a, a aircraft. Um, uh, um, I want to dive into one specifically, and maybe um, Kathy can talk about this because it's um, uh, Kathy with a with with a uh, with a C, not a K. So, um, uh, and certainly flying. Um, um, trikes. This is a very important consideration. We did a question. If a general a aviation aircraft lose power to take off, initial climb requires immediate nose down action. Um, a, this person asked, how critical is this in ultralights with slow inertia and outside drag? And I think if we move into uh, trikes, that certainly is a, is a significant factor, I would think, right? Yes. I, I think one of the things I find with the general aviation people uh, flying the trikes that initially they are so surprised at how much drag is on a trike, um, and yet it still flies so well. But on takeoff, um, as you mentioned in your video, uh, we have a tremendous climb rate, and often um, you'll go up a lot quicker than you need to. So, um, and obviously, uh, when the engine quits, it goes down at the same rate it climbs. So it's it's a fairly abrupt drop, and and I would say based on my limited experience with general aviation air, fixed wing aircraft, the trike, you have to react a lot faster. Um, you don't have as much time, uh, certainly close to the ground. And because it's more physical, you have to get it into a faster airspeed uh, position, pull, pull the bar in, uh, get a little bit faster airspeed so it's easier to maintain, and then slowly climb back out of it. So it it is, I would say more important with a trike um, because you will notice the nose goes down rather suddenly. That's so that's looking at the trike side. Now, Bill, um, maybe we could move to um, sort of three axis um, fixed wing aircraft. And I know that uh, you provided my first transition many years ago on that Savannah that we built. And it was the, uh, it was the, it was an it was incredible transition for me. So the same kind of question, um, certainly in the loss of an engine on a, a general aviation aircraft, get it, uh, you have to get the nose down quickly. Let's talk about um, if there's any differences um, with a, uh, with an ultralight. Well, I don't have that much experience in uh, general aviation, but in the ultralight, because of the drag, you do have to get the nose down pretty quick pretty rapidly to maintain uh, proper speed so you can flare for the touchdown. So pretty much the same kind of thing. And that's why I asked Kathy to, um, to sort of talk about, uh, to talk about kites. Uh, Derek, I don't think it makes much difference, right? As far as uh, PPGs are concerned. <laughs> yeah, no, pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you lose power, you have to prepare for uh, for landing. We don't push any sticks. We don't have any sticks, so just just fly upwind and uh, prepare for flaring. That's uh, that's all you do. Perfect. There's a question that came in from um, uh, Perry Graham um, uh, in the chat box here. I don't know if you guys are watching the chat box here, but the question Perry's got is recurrent training required for the ultralight pilot permit. Kathy, you might probably be the one most suitable to answer that. You think? Is recurrent training required to maintain your permit? The short answer is yes. That's all the answer that Perry probably needs. <laughs> <laughs> there's, um, there's two currencies and recencies, and I always get confused on which is which. One is act as PIC of an aeroplane, if you've got an aeroplane license, <clears throat> within five years to maintain currency. The other is a two-year requirement to be up to date on rules and regulations and whatever else transport decides would be appropriate, like safety issues and stuff. And, and yes, this applies to all pilots, regardless of your license or permit. Okay. Um, Derek, I want to talk a little bit about um, paramotors um, and uh, uh, You've taken quite a number of GA folks and transitioned them um, <laughs> to fly um, PPGs. Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what the challenges are faced by a GA guy um, giving some consideration. And I meant that guy generally, guy or gal, of course, um, uh, transitioning to, um, to uh, a uh, PPG. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, the, the, the most common the most common challenge um, that we get to face when, when talking to the 
to the fixed wing pilot is um, their lack of understanding that the powered parachute or powered paraglider um, training is really about gaining manual skills that are uh, that are built on the ground. Before you go flying, you, you you have to spend time learning how to how to control your wing, how to sort the lines, how to uh, open the wing properly, how to bring it over your head and uh, accelerate into flight, and um, that is that is all manual. It's like you know, I always say it's kind of very similar to uh, to learning how to swim. You can you can learn how to stay afloat fairly quickly, but in order to swim across the lake, you have to practice, and that is exactly how you learn uh, powered parachutes. And the 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 moments that I see from fixed wing pilots is that they come to me and they ask me, "Hey, how long is the training?" And um, I use this common denominator, very simple. It, it does not apply to every pilot, but I say, well, if you're 40, you're gonna need 40 hours on the ground to, to learn how to maintain the wing. If you're 50, you're gonna need 50 hours. If you're 60, you see where I'm going with this. And then they say, well, what are you talking about? I, you know, I transitioned from plane A to plane B in five hours and that was it. What are you talking about, right? So, so there's a bit of that. And um, yeah, but we, we, have a, we have a lot of interest from, uh, from, a, from a, a fixed wing uh, pilots and, uh, successfully we transitioned quite a lot of them and uh yeah it's been it's been great thanks very much um thomas warren has uh written and so this is probably open to um uh to uh to everyone because you're all well uh, maybe um maybe not so much derek because it's primarily two stroke um but uh, Thomas wrote, I learned some years ago that uh, mean time between failures of two stroke engines was about 95 hours. Um, so has this changed and hopefully improved? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Well, a properly maintained two stroke engine should last at least 300 hours. Uh, that's from my experience. And Bill, so when they say properly maintained, so so you know what's so what what does that exactly mean? Uh, means uh, like checking your fuel, changing the fuel filter, uh, not letting it uh, overheat, uh, proper oil mixture, um, proper carburetor adjustment uh, relating to the seasons, the temperature. Okay. Everyone else pretty much agree with that. You're all flying two strokes um, or uh, um, in some of the aircraft. Any I'm other not comments? I, I'm, oh, go Sorry, Kathy. I was going to say, I'm not sure where 95 hours came from because um, most of the ones I know about last a lot longer than that, unless they're abused. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not paying attention to the engine as you should be and taking care of it. Yeah. Kathy Montgomery, and, anything uh, to add? Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I'm a, I, I, I firmly love the two-stroke engines. I have a 912 as well, but I feel like uh, very often there's a couple things come into play is, is uh, the fuel is a huge issue with people. They don't often realize uh, how important it is. Um, dirt in the fuel is it probably, I don't know, 80% of the, the problems I see. And also um, the fact that running them more often, um, you know, if you're running a two-stroke on a regular basis, it hasn't been sitting, it, it makes a huge difference in how long the engine lasts. But but mostly I really do find that they're, they're, they're a great engine. And uh, and though you might see the problems, as you mentioned in your video, it, they might be more sudden. Um, if you're operating the, the engine properly as well, uh, approaching with a little bit of warmth on the engine at all times, so when the go-around happens, you'll, you'll do it safely. Uh, you won't cold seed your engine, but I really do find that they, other than that, you know, if you're not maintaining them, it might be a sudden stoppage where it's 912, you're going to see more problems along the way. Great. Super. Um, Kevin Tromley um, asks, uh, this is, um, can a two seat fun flyer registered as a basic ultralight be re-registered as an advanced ultralight or amateur built? So, Kathy, that sounds like something, uh, sorry, Kathy Lubitz, UPAC, might be sound something that's uh, relevant um, to you. So a two-seat fun flyer registered as a basic ultralight, um, can it be re-registered as an advanced ultralight or amateur build? Usually not. So 
the basic ultralight has no standards for construction, for maintenance, um, for ongoing operations. Whereas an amateur built comes under a whole set of different regulations. Um, and you get into an amateur built by starting with a project and building the plane. Um, and there are pre-cover inspections um, as well as final inspections and other requirements. So it is unlikely, although I have heard of a few, um, but generally an amateur build has to start as a project of parts as opposed to something that's completed and you want to just change it. Um, as far as the advanced ultralight, you have to have a manufacturer involved. And the manufacturer would have to issue a statement of conformity for that particular airplane. Um, there's been a couple that have come in from the States and the manufacturers agreed, but it's not likely because the manufacturer, because he signs his statement of conformity, he's taking on some liability. So not usually. Um, I don't know what else to say. I'll have to check with MDRA for the amateur builds or the manufacturer for your advanced ultralight. Mm -hmm. Actually, Kathy, while I still get you up, this is a this is a very easy uh, answer. I'm sure that's going to come forward. But Alexander Gucci, I, I'm I'm going to I'll butcher Alexander's last name. Gutierrez asks you this. Hey, Kathy, are you still flying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it would be an, a simple one to answer. Not necessarily as much because there's other distractions going on. But yes, still flying, still instructing. Um, we've been doing it a long time, so we're slowing down a little bit. But yeah, got to fly. <laughs> got to fly, exactly. Got to fly. Um, flying um, ultralights into the United States. A question about... Um, can can we can we fly our aircraft or uh, our ultralights into the states? Anyone want to? Short answer: Yes. <laughs> Short answer: Yes. That's a the FAA pretty... has a uh, six month special authorization that you download off the internet, carry it with the airplane. There are specifications, and one of them is that an ultralight pilot with an instructor rating can or another license, but an ultralight pilot with no instructor rating cannot. I don't know what the distinction was, um, but we're, the, we've, we've approached the FAA to take that away um, and they're mulling it over. I don't know whether it'll come through with the new uh, mosaic regulations or not. Uh, and there was no passenger carrying when the FAA issued the special flight authorization. So that's not even mentioned. So. Yes, both basic and advanced provided that. And that list of requirements is on the authorization. Um, so go to the FAA, put F FAA uh, special authorization for Canadian ultralights. The title will come up with advanced ultralights, but if you read it, it applies to both basic and advanced. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Um, I got another, there's another um, two stroke uh, question, which has um, come up here. Um, and this is, um, are water-cooled two-stroke engines more reliable than the air-cooled ones? Any any idea, any shots at that from uh, you guys? Are you familiar with um, water versus? I could jump in on that one. Um, Great, thanks. I am not a I'm not a uh, air airplane mechanic by any means, but I do I do from from my I've I've flown both uh, extensively. And I have found that, you know, depending on the design, the water cooled can be a, a, a little bit more of an issue um, in that often the air, the, you have to be very careful that the air flows there as well. And if the trike or airplane is, is you know, been designed for yourself you ha or you've added things to it, you can block that airflow. And I've actually overheated an uh, engine that way. And I also found that depending on where the rad was mounted, uh, you know, even the passenger could block that airflow. So it can it can be a very reliable engine, but you just have to be aware of that factor in the design. Um, I have an additional comment. Um, you're adding another system to the airplane. So the air cooled has just air cooling and mixed gas. Once you add um, the um, the water cooling, you're adding another system. You're adding more components which may be subject to failing. So in a lot of ways, the air cooler is simpler, um, not as powerful, but 
the price you're paying is a little more critical. Uh, Ted, sorry, we're, we lost your audio. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Yep. So um, one of the online questions that we got, and I apologize because we don't get names with them. So I, I normally like to recognize who asked the question, but here's a question. As a private pilot, I'm required to have endorsements such as a seaplane rating to fly my float plane. The question is, why does an ultralight pilot not need to have a seaplane rating to, or a seaplane rating to fly their advanced ultralight? Is that Any me idea? again? <laughs> the differences in the light, the privileges of the license. So a private pilot is restricted to land or sea, unless you get a rating for the alternate configuration. An ultralight pilot is not restricted that way. You can fly any ultralight. So there's no land or sea distinction. Great. Boy, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm looking at all these, um, I'm looking at the questions and there uh, there's some really interesting ones, but they all tend to go towards regulations. Um, and I don't want to, I mean, poor Kathy is going to be up here all of the time, but, um, uh, but there is one that, um, oh, uh, Alexander, by the way, says uh, Kathy and uh, who asked the original question, the two-stroke question, uh, Kathy squared uh, C and K for your answers right on point. So good work. Um, instructor rating, uh, uh, inst instructor ratings, uh, Daniel D asks what process does it take to earn an instructor rating and um and i know that uh, bill and um uh, 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 helped tag team my instructor rating so bill maybe you could give um give daniel d an idea what it takes to become an ultralight instructor you're up uh, all right well you need about uh 20 hours of uh flight experience in the ultralight and there's a 20 hour ground school and uh, then your instructors uh, training basically uh, you need to do uh, all of your flight maneuvers from the instructor seat so after uh, 20 hours of uh, instructors training then you write a test with transport canada and there's also uh, Transport Canada examiner that will uh, take you for your test flight. I'm going to keep you up for one. For, and, and don't, and don't worry. This is not, well, it might be a hard one, um, but I'm going to go around the table. So you guys, others can all get ready. So um, let's see here. So this is from Thomas W. I have to ask the question. I guess maybe people think two strokes, maybe four strokes, or maybe think even GA. How many engine failures have each of you experienced? <laughs> Well, I have personally experienced one engine failure while I was still training with Jack. Um, Jack took the blame for that. He says I didn't have the right thermostat in for the 582. I've had an experience flying a brand new uh, Challenger delivering uh, to Bradford, flying in the snow. It was snowing pretty hard and it uh, basically clogged the air filter. I've had uh, another uh, engine failure with a GA pilot at Baldwin where uh, we turned base and the engine quit. And the pilot says, well, should we try and restart the engine? And I said, no, the runway is right there. Let's just fly to the runway. Uh, I've had an uh, airplane that had fuel restriction. And I've had an airplane that basically ran out of gas. And both of those were with uh, GA pilots who said the plane was ready to go. And oh. I accepted that and off we went. So let's put it in perspective though. How many flight hours do you have? Over 5,000. Okay. I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in. I didn't expect such a big list from you, Bill, but um, <laughs> I mean, I guess that um, GA pilots may be concerned about uh, the reliability of the engines thinking in terms of obviously that two stroke uh, came up and 95 hours was uh I'm expecting between overhauls, but um, normally these engines are, I mean, if you maintain them properly, 
and you making sure your fuel and stuff is uh, is correct and making sure the aircraft uh, is fit for flight pretty well. Does anybody else want to make a mention of this or any any issues or not? Not a word. <laughs> I, I, no, I uh, don't mind. Oh, go ahead, Derek. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually wanted to add something uh, that would be probably strange sounding for for fixed wing pilots. Um, for us, engine out is not an event really, because we, we fly powered paraglider, and and the and the paraglider as as by design is a is a glider. So so it just glides, right? Our takeoff and, and landing field can be extremely short. And in my flying career, I had two two engine outs. One one went to the spark plug cup, just just jumping out of the the spark plug, and the second one was related to the fuel. I just I just run out of fuel coming back to to my to my landing field. Um, in the first case, I just landed in the first field. I you know I I, I simply glided down, uh, put the spark plug back, and started the engine again. And I took off and I continued my flight. The second time, I just called my friend. He picked me up and. And, and, and it was quite uneventful. So part of our training is that we train for the event of not having the engine and just landing in a, in a, in a spot that we pick. Um, while you're up, um, uh, we do have a question from John C that says, now he's categorized all ultralights tend to fly mostly early in the morning and uh, evenings. Why is that? I know the reason certainly for paramotors and maybe you could talk about that. Then maybe I could move to Kathy to talk about the trikes. So why, yeah, prim primarily why do you fly early and late? Yeah, very, very good question. So, um, you know, there's a concept, there's a, con there, there, there's a common concept that says powered paragliders, all, all ultralight generally are restricted in some sense to flying more. That comes from the fact that, um, you know, being a light aircraft, we don't really enjoy flying midday in bumps, in thermal conditions, and that creates a lot of, lot of, you know, wing movement and, and um, turbulence. So simply, simply, simply that, right? Like, like nobody likes flying that. It's, it's, it's unpleasant. Um, so for that reason, PPG tend to fly, you know, mornings and evenings when the conditions are smooth and nice, and, and you can relax and enjoy your slow flight. Uh, with that said, there's a large group of uh, powered paragliders that fly in midday conditions as well. And to make things even more interesting, they would, uh, using the, the, the specifics of a paraglider that we fly, um, they will fly up to a certain altitude, usually 600, 700 feet, uh, connect with the thermal and start coring the thermal, shut the engine and, 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 and go in a sort of very classic paraglider way. And then either they restart the engine and continue their flight after they, they, they go out of that thermal or they they just glide down and and land as a as a as a classic paraglider. So there's no restriction. Anybody can do it. You can fly midday. There's nothing against it. It's just your personal limits. Whether you like to be in a bumpy air, whether you understand the air, because that's also a safety element, uh, and 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 that's practically it. If we move to um, trikes, Kathy, early and late in the day, is that primarily when you're training or and are you flying? So yes, I um, I train usually from half hour before sunup to about nine thirty or ten. Um, I you know because our our system is we don't have any mechanical uh, connections to to the wing. It, we're physically flying the wing, and we have a big wing area. So we typically fly that time of the day because it's less work. It's way more enjoyable. I, I tell people all the time when they say, well, you hardly get flying at all. And I say, well, you got six hours a day, you know, three hours in the morning and often three hours in the afternoon, in, in the evening. And so it's just so, it's like night and day uh, compared to flying midday. You can fly midday. It's just a lot of work. And sometimes it's way beyond most people's experience. And they'll get themselves into trouble that way, flying late in the morning because of the thermals when they go to land. And they just don't have the physical or the uh, aggression to fly because they just don't have that experience. But it's not to say you can't fly the trikes midday. We certainly do, but it's it's not very enjoyable. If we looked at the uh, fixed wing, I know I saw I'm seeing Kathy just eager to eager to talk here about this. Um, I mean, this is not sort of the old lawn chairs. Ultralights are not the old lawn. Not that there's anything wrong with it, because I mean I'm a paramotor guy. I've never actually been on a trike, but I'm a, well. I, 
years ago I went for a ride on one. But let's talk about three axis, Kathy, and I can just see you're just jumping here to go. Not particularly. The only thing I wanted to really mention is the airplanes can handle it. It's pilot comfort in most cases. So that's basically a generality, but it's true. So yeah, as long as the plane can handle the winds, the G-loading, all the rest of that, and most of the manufacturers have that information, um, it's comfort level of the pilot, how much work he wants to do, whether he wants to sit around, sorry, enjoy the flight or work the whole time he's up there. Or she, sorry. Okay, great. Um, there seems to be some uh, questions that are focused on medicals. Uh, and maybe we'll take a couple of these for sure. Um, and Kevin uh, D um, suggests that not just he, but um, he feels that uh, many GA pilots uh, might be interested to know the differences in medical requirements. So are there differences in medical requirements from sort of GA um, to, uh, to, to ultralights? And what's perhaps the attraction of that? You may want to there's, talk about that. Oh, there's a yeah. regulation uh, CAR 424, which lists all the medical requirements or medical standards. And you can go down the list and see category one, category two, three, and four. In a lot of cases, the category four is less restrictive. Um, one example, you do not have a heart issue. You do not have a hearing issue. Whereas in the category three, it will have, I have never had, or if I have, uh, I have to go to CAMI and get it resolved. So yes, because we are flying smaller, lighter weight, less capable, if you will, airplanes don't do all the traveling, usually don't do all the traveling that the general aviation pilot does. We're not considered as much of a threat to the public or to other airplanes because we're out doing our own thing. At least that's the rationale, I think. Um, transport has, has fewer requirements. For example, color blindness is not an issue for ultralight pilots, whereas it might be for private pilots. So if you're really interested, Google um, pilot medical standards, CAR 424, Civil Aviation Re Re uh, Regulation 424 something, um, and you should be able to find it. Okay, we're back here. Um, I was just going to jump in on that too, Ted, if you don't yeah, mind. Okay. I get that I get that question a lot um, about the medical, and I think uh, there's a little bit of a misconception about that. Uh, you know, if someone's getting older, they can go to a category three uh, or category four from category three, and and then you know fly ultralights. And the 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 idea is not that, but it, they they have to realize that if if they don't meet it, even if they sign this and they they don't meet some of those requirements, they're not going to be covered under their insurance. So I tell people, you know, be sure to be honest uh, and go to see a, a, an aviation doctor if you really can't answer all those questions, because it's not a loophole to get around flying when you're older and you don't meet certain requirements. There's there's one other comment on that. Um, I've I've heard from people who want to fly ultralights because they've got a problem with their category three medical. Once transport has a medical issue on your file, it stays on your file. So if you've got a category four, if you wanna go from category four to category three, sorry, three to four, you still have to go to a civil aviation medical examiner. So if you want to fly ultralights on an ultralight pilot permit, uh, get your transitioning and your permit before you have a medical issue. And then again, like Kathy said, uh, be honest on the self-declared medical application. Ted, you're muted again. I was going to say, Ted, I can't hear him. There you go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I've got a, a question that's come in on the internet um, uh, from our, the original program. Oh, sorry, it's from Henry V. Um, wants, and actually, um, perhaps he's already an ultralight pilot, but he wanted to um, have someone emphasize or wax poetic on the need to control adverse yaw at slow speeds. And also to talk a little bit about um, control input, more critical with taxiing in winds in these light aircraft. 
Anybody want to, um, you know, talk about adverse yaw um, as it relates to like more general aviation aircraft and also with the weight of the aircraft uh, taxing? Nobody. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I always do. Um, so the trikes are not affected by yaw quite as much as a fixed wing um, aircraft, but uh, I, I do notice a tremendous amount on takeoff and especially throws a, a fixed wing pilot off. Um, some of the some of the trikes that are only just a few years old, uh, don't have the engine offset just so. And if you apply too much power, you know, with the 912, it immediately goes into a pretty steep right turn. So you have to learn to control the throttle a little better, uh, correct for that right away uh, because uh, because it is a substantial turn. Um, the other thing that you mentioned about taxiing is a huge thing with, with trikes. Um, it's one of the reasons I make people taxi for half an hour, at least twice, because they don't realize the effect of someone running up on the, on the, on the apron, uh, and, and taking off behind another plane and how hard it is to control the wing. I, I, I can give an example of, uh, I was sitting on the apron one day and an OPP helicopter flew in. And I asked him not to take off, and he actually took off and lifted my trike. Two of us were hanging on the wires to hold it on the ground. So it's a substantial thing to think about um, with the wind on the ground. Taxi takes a lot of practice in a trike. It's, e it's easy to be flipped over if you're not ready. I think that applies to any lightweight ultralight relative to the, the general aviation heavier airplanes. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's the airplane and and the capability of the airplane, but I do know that in some of the ultralights you can run out of rudder, so you know yaw is very important. Um, but again, you you have to know the plane and know what the capabilities are, and the limitations, and that's part of transitioning. Ted. You know what? It was really funny in the very beginning when we did our little check. I said, um, I may, I'll remind you guys when you're on mute, when you're on mute, but um, but I have someone helping me with the questions. And so I keep muting and talking to that person. So I apologize. So just remember, mute, mute. So I'm getting a lot of questions on what can we fly? Where can we fly? Things like that. And it seems to be also a recurrent theme um, from, uh, let's see, an Andre B, uh, Perry G, Rick. P. So here's a couple of questions um, that deal with um, um, if you've got a um, um, uh, an ultralight permit, are you allowed to fly airplanes registered rather than an ultralight if they meet a certain specifications? I know, Kathy, this is one of your favorite subjects. Now you're mute. I haven't said there. I said something. I didn't say anything. Um, the ultralight is a definition in the regulations. Anything that's 1,200 pounds or less, 45 miles per hour, um, um, stall speed or less, and let's see, landing configuration, and then there's a minimum useful load. Um, because it's a definition, you can fly airplanes in other categories that meet that definition. Um, what was part two on that, Ted? Um... Oh, um, no, I think that that was basically it. Basically, well, you know, what, what could they fly um, with, the, um, with, the, with the ultralight license? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a gross weight definition. Somebody mentioned a Cessna 150. Well, the Cessna 150 has an empty weight of 1,100 and something pounds. So Cessna 150 is out of the picture because mm -hmm. it's too heavy at gross weight. So you have to be careful with that. Um, one caution is the maintenance and all the other standards go with the airplane that the, the category in which the airplane is registered. So home builds still have their annual inspections. They're still required to have fire extinguishers, ELTs, all the rest of that, as are the certified or owner maintained. So because you're using it as an ultralight doesn't exempt you from the maintenance requirements of the category it's registered in. While you're up, Kathy, um, helmets. 
so there's just a general question about wearing helmets. So where, wh when and where do helmets legally need to be worn? Every time you're in a basic ultralight airplane, you need to have a helmet on. Um, coincidentally, the helmet definition is not there. But if the idea is to protect your head, um, then you want one that's substantial, like a football helmet, motorcycle helmet something along that line, but Transport Canada doesn't have any standards on the helmet required. Um, and I think it's a good idea in some of these other airplanes. I know a pilot who was in a crash in a J3 Cub at the front seat and his head bounced around those steel bars and cracked the helmet instead of his head. And the only reason they had the helmet on is because their other intercom system wasn't working and that one they put that on at the last minute. So it was very fortunate for him. So I think helmets are a good idea regardless. And the idea is to protect your head. So wearing a leather one or a bicycle one probably isn't good enough. In a lot of cases, the ultralights and the basic ultralights, especially in the open air, the helmets also have your communication built in. So that's another reason to wear one. Uh, not required in advanced ultralight, not required in other categories, but maybe a good idea. Okay. Um, Alex, Alexander G asked, um, survivability after a crash landing, considering how fragile these planes are, are they really fragile? Anyone want to take a shot at that? It's called a splat factor. <laughs> it's mass times momentum. You have a lot less mass and you're going a lot slower. So if you come down under control, you have a lot better capability of avoiding really serious outcomes. Not to say it doesn't happen, but you know, it's a lighter airplane at a slower speed. Your mass and momentum are a lot less. So it's like um, when I had my first aircraft, my Aronka Champ, they said it could just, I think they said this about the Piper Cub, but we just adapted the Champ. It could just barely kill you or something like that. So anyway. Yeah. Um, I, could I maybe talk a little bit about that, Ted? Absolutely. I get, I, I get that question a lot about the, um, you know, you know what happens when the engine quits. Um, and going back to your comment, you know, I, I, have, about, I have over 3,000 hours on trikes and 600 hours on a two-stroke, never had a pickup even. So, uh, but also as Cassie says, you come down slower. Um, we're, I'm landing, I'm touching down at 30, Five miles an hour and not only that but the, the the particular trike that i fly now it's so overly well built it's incredible and it, even in even in a crash it would take a lot of a lot to really crumple it so um you know it's it people are generally amazed when they actually see them up close how they're made now they're very different than they were 30 years ago the engines are hugely different and so um the survivability i think is 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 just you know, it's a non-event, as Derek said. If, if you have an engine out and, and you've got what I tell all my student, students, height is your friend, um, you, you'll have time to make a good choice and land as you usually land, just nice and safe, the same way you always do. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah. Now, here's an, one that will be sort of all over the map with you guys. Um, so when it comes to runway, for ultralights everyone's thinking obviously grassroots like truly grassroots and um and assuming tires on gear so it doesn't disqualify you derek because i mean you do have tires on gear if you've got a cart but i mean uh, adidas are kind of like tires on gear as well the question is um what considerations have you got to have because it says literally it appears that you don't need much length so the questions are length, width, grass, long, short, just trying to understand what the considerations might be um, from someone who is, I would think, based on the question, um, giving consideration to ultralights versus coming from um, like a, uh, perhaps a runway environment, which they may have learned on and may be res restricted to. So, I, I, and I know it's, it's gonna vary with each aircraft. So uh, each aircraft type. And Derek, let's start with you from a runway consideration. Yes, uh, very good question. Um, I don't know many aircraft that would be that would need such a short runway as the powered paragliders do. 
uh, uh, probably um, gyroplanes. They can land on a very short period on a very short runway span. Paragliders. What we need to keep in mind is the wind speed, and the greater the wind speed, which is not higher than our trim speed, what we can do on our wing, obviously decreases our our ground speed. So what that means, for example, just uh, just to talk numbers, if my wing flies 30 kilometers an hour trim speed and I have a 10 kilometer wind, I need 20 kilometers of uh, of, of uh, speed in order to take off. Um, from 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 experience, I know that's usually uh, literally you know less than 50 feet, and this is the same for landing. Uh, we have to go upwind, obviously. That's a very that's a very important factor, um, and and so. We, we need to go upwind, and sometimes when we fly from airfields uh, where uh, general aviation is present or fixed wing pilots flying, this is a bit of a controversy because we have to take uh, take off, uh, um, you know, across the runway. Uh, but on the flip side, we don't have a rudder problem. We we just we don't we don't push any any pedals. We just go upwind and, and fly that way. Others want to talk a little about our runway conditions length. Considerations? I think you have the same considerations you do for any GA aircraft. So the higher performance um, probably need a lot more room. Um, smaller wings require more length, uh, less lift, more length. We talked a little bit about that in the transition. Um, engine horsepower makes a big difference, just like any other GA type aircraft that you might be familiar with. I, I also think that, uh, so, well, at least from, from a, a someone transitioning, uh, if, they, if they're coming from um, general aviation, they often think that they don't need hardly any runway for the, for, uh, for the ultralights. And it really, to me, always depends on the approach um, and, and the takeoff area. It, it, because, like Kathy says, the weight's a huge difference. But I, I do find people have in their mind that that they not they, they can just cut something out of the woods, and that doesn't work. That uh, particularly with the trikes, we tend to come in steeper than fixed wing ultralights, and um, and so uh, that being that we have more control over the wing physically, um, I just find that generally they underestimate the the length of the runway. And I would say, as a beginner or somebody transitioning big on my trikes that I tell them to have 2,000 feet, you know, so it seems like a lot, but I would say if that's a figure, it certainly is the best to start at if you're a beginner. When we're getting into the air, flight training, some basic questions as far as training. Three-axis ultralight, do you practice stall and spiral during, um, during your training? Um, and it says, of course, if the training ultralight can support it, but the question is, do you practice stall or spirals during training? in the three axis side. Kathy or Bill? Well, we do practice stalls, but uh, we don't do any uh, uh, spiral. Okay. We get into stalls, stall prevention. If you don't stall, you're not gonna spin. And I don't think the planes are rated very much for spirals, although I have heard that um, it's been done. So um, again, whatever information you can find from the manufacturer if the airplane's rated. And uh, the training should include some of that as well. So if you were to start off basically um, going after your ultralight permit, so not necessarily transitioning into an ultralight coming um, from, from GA into ultralight, um, is the um, curriculum, is the syllabus pretty much kind of the same i mean it's obviously it's obviously streamlined but i'm talking the actual flight training would it be similar to ga or either you're familiar with with the ga syllabus or or whatever i'm not talking about getting into the minutia but obviously you're doing whatever the aircraft would do you're talking about um stalls you're going to be doing steep turns i guess precautionary approaches all of that is parallel the ga world what's mm -hmm. different in a lot of cases is the ground school uh, in the GA world, you've got an AME that's going to take care of your airplane. In the ultralight world and even the amateur built world, you're responsible for your own airplane. So in a lot of cases, the ground schools and the information and the pre-takeoff checks will be different. In the air, we go through the same, well, pretty well the same um, flight, uh, flight tests or flight uh, exercises. 
Someone made a note, and it's actually uh, relevant pretty much to the original video we put together. And it really hits squarely with uh, Derek and Kathy Montgomery, especially if you're transitioning from, um, from general aviation aircraft. And it talks in terms of the differences between, um, obviously, three axis. Um, and in GA, if you're transitioning, everything's kind of the same. You're getting bigger, you're heavier, you're getting more complex. But if you're thinking of ultralights, there are a number of flavors, like weight shift trikes, like paramotors, like three axis. And, um, and, and the point that they're making here is, of course, that even if you're an expert in one category of ultralights, three axis, Good luck on uh, PPG. Good luck on on weight shift trike. You just can't get in it and and fly safely, obviously, because things are quite different. But in the um, three axis side, the same holds true. And I think that specifically talks about um, tractor versus pusher. There are very few pushers in the GA side. You've got Lake Amphibian. You've got the CB. There's a couple of other flavors with with um, uh, pushers. And Bill, I know you're quite an expert with the Challenger aircraft. And so, so a three axis person going from um, something like a Savannah um, and then thinking about a Challenger, what, do, what are the challenges they're going to face with that um, going to a Challenger? Well, two things. Um, the fact that it's a pusher, uh, as you apply power, <laughs> you, you have to hold the, the stick back. Uh, as you reduce the power, the nose will go up, so you have to move the stick forward. Um, that would be the first thing. Also, on takeoff, when you're adding power, uh, the aircraft tends to want to go off to the left, so you'll have to apply right rudder. And uh, same when you take the power off, the aircraft wants to go off to the right, so you have to apply left rudder. I think... Um, a lot of pilots who are trying to transition to something like a Challenger, they have difficulties with that. When they find that they need to add rudder, they're over ruddering and they expect that just moving the ailerons is going to make the airplane do what they want, not realizing that there's a certain amount of uh, rudder required. And it's not usually a lot like in motion, but a lot in detail, like in attention. And that's where uh, a lot of people transitioning come up short uh, by overdoing uh, everything. While you're up. I'd like to comment on that for just a minute. The Challenger, because of the belt drive system, um, the engine torque is in the opposite direction of the gear drive. So right. when you're going left, the rest of us are going right. So we're back to what we said in the transition. Make sure you do what the airplane needs to have done to go straight down the runway. Correct. So. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. And I do have a, not so much a question, but a clarification from Kevin B. So it's a clarification on Kathy's comment. GA World, by the way, the owner pilot's also responsible for the maintenance, not the AME. I noticed that a change in certain some of my aircraft in the last 10 or 20 years. And specifically, um, uh, I move things here, but specifically saying that um, that the um, that the GA uh, owner of an aircraft is ultimately responsible um, for the maintenance and has to know what's being done, and the person is qualified to do it. So, just a, and that was a good, I think, a good um, clarification, certainly from um, from. So, from, from can I make a comment? Absolutely. He's right. Perfectly right. The air, the airplane owner is totally responsible for the maintenance of his airplane. Uh, in the GA world, you have to have somebody sign a maintenance release in the logbook. And in most cases, that has to be an AME. The AME will only do what you tell them to do. Um, this was a let that happened when the owner maintenance category came out because the AMEs did not want to be responsible for the condition of the airplanes. So they made the owner responsible. So the AME will point out the ADs or any maintenance that needs to be done, any repairs. The owner gets to decide whether they need to be done now or later. It is the owner that's responsible. The difference in the um, ultralight world is we have no person required to sign a maintenance release. Um, and 
in fact, in some ways, that's that's a problem because we've got people maintaining airplanes that may not know enough about them. But what we have found uh, in reality is most pilots who don't know, I'm talking ultralight and amateur built, second owners, if people aren't familiar with the airplanes, they're going to find somebody who is. They are not going to bet their life on an airplane that's not properly maintained or repaired. So um, just my two cents. So uh, thanks, Kathy. I think that that's, that helps certainly clarify that. And actually, I've got a, I've got a, um, a tune-up for me from Jan N., who basically said, Ted, you modified my question. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm trying to read stuff as it's zooming by here. Um, basically, um, and that's why I asked Bill to talk about the difference between uh, tractor and, and pusher within the three axis. Specifically, what uh, Jan N. was saying was he wants to uh, emphasize the difference between weight shift trikes and three axis. Even if you're an expert in one category, you could easily cure yourself in the other without proper training, and especially in emergencies, because the control is reverse. So I know that three axis, and I see uh, Kathy Montgomery, I know three axis and weight shift are quite different. So I'll let you certainly weigh in and, and complete uh, Jan Ann's um, uh, co comment to me. Uh, thanks for your question, Jan. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that, that uh, can go wrong when you're transitioning with from fixed wing to trike. Um, and what I tell people always is, honestly, just if that's where you're going to skimp on the money, don't do it. Get the training or spend a lot of time with some people. Hang out at hangers, sit in the trikes, get used to the control. But um, certainly, yes, on takeoff, uh, you know, I can tell you hundreds of instances where I lift off, pilot the, uh, the trainee pulls in instead of leaving it in trip or pushing forward slightly, depending on the machine, and we instantly start to go to the ground. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, just a, a natural reaction if you're training in, if you're trained in, in a fixed wing, same on landing. Uh, when it comes to the flare, we're just gently pushing out and very often they pull in right abruptly as we're close to the ground. So what I tell people is you have to forget that training. Um, and one thing I'm going to emphasize too is not to try and train on two different things at one time. It doesn't work fixed wing to try. You have to completely forget that and, and try and, and relearn the trike or relearn how to fly. But, and I, I really, um, but I have to give credit to the, a lot of the commercial pilots I've trained that they are willing to put in the time and it makes a difference. I've trained guys with 3000 hours on King, King airs and Sunwing pilots, and they generally take more than 10 hours to transition. So just don't have a, a, an hour thing in your head when you have to transition because it takes it takes a lot of memory to forget all these natural inputs when it comes to the, the last short little two seconds you have to make a decision. Thanks. And in kind of my defense, as, as feeble as it might be, I was looking at the difference between what happens engine out, engine on in an ultralight, whether it's a pusher or a tractor, which actually ends up having the same kind of uh issues things to, uh, tend to be uh tend to be reversed and then of course everything is completely different with derek's program with, with with derek's aircraft um I, I i actually wanted to add something here um which is which is sort of a general thought that i have um i think it's a common sense for every pilot that at least been in the air once once in their lifetime that you want to get trained for, for just that you're going to be flying it uh i don't think uh and this is and this is sort of Regarding the question regarding the the, the three axis and, and and other tracks, um, you know our our permit is very very open to fly all kinds of aircraft. It I think the pilot with the common sense would say, well, I was trained on powered parachute, so I, that doesn't mean that I know how to fly trikes or any other aircraft other than powered parachute. What I was trained on, and one final thing. Um, I don't know if this is the same for other kind of ultralights, but power parachute specifically, when you're trained on a power parachute, you get a restriction in your permit saying your permit is restricted to powered parachutes only. So that means that your 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 permit allows you to fly only powered parachutes. And if you want to go and fly other aircraft, you have to go to somebody like uh, like you know Kathy or or the other Kathy and and or Bill, and and you have to retrain on that kind of aircraft and get that restriction by just doing the extra time on that aircraft. And uh, that'll be my two cents. Great. 
Thanks very much. We've had a couple of questions. Uh, the most recent one from Ernie uh, W regarding comment on what it takes uh, to qualify for passenger carrying endorsement, age, hours, et cetera. What does it take for passenger carrying? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Um, I didn't want to go into the weeds on the licensing issues and the privileges this on this, because we're talking about transitioning to airplanes, sorry, to different ultralights. Um, and I see Graham Peplers has one about transitioning from ultralights back to 150s. Um, but to get a passenger carrying rating, you have to do more. Um, transport wants, well, the ultralight permit is a minimal license, if you will. And the basic ultralight is an airplane that has no standards. They don't want passengers in them, period, because we don't take, well, we do take care, but regulatory wise, there's no requirement to um, do much with the airplane to protect a passenger. Um, the advanced ultralight has the standards and the ongoing maintenance as required by the manufacturer. Um, and, an air, and a passenger can be put in an advanced ultralight and the other categories of airplanes. So passenger carrying is two parts, the pilot and the airplane. Both have to have passenger carrying as a privilege of the license or the aircraft category. So um, ultralight pilot permits 10 hours. Uh, a passenger carrying uh, rating is, another, is 20, 20 or 25. So you have to do more. So you're doing more dual. You're doing more... Um, a little bit across country. Uh, you're just taking more time to learn more and practice more. And that presumably helps trend or assures transport that we're taking extra care to protect that passenger. Uh, in fact, the ultralight passenger carrying rating is generally the same as the rec pilot permit. And I have told people um, if you get the rec pilot permit, you can carry a passenger in an advanced ultralight, and you can also rent other airplanes. Um, it's it's a big picture um, suggestion. You can do more with a rec pilot permit than you can with the ultralight and passenger carrying rating. But if all you want to do is fly ultralights, and if you want to carry a passenger, passenger carrying rating is good. You just have to do more. Thanks. We've had uh, a question and even I think someone else has answered it uh, in the uh, in the question pane is, uh, can you fly an ultralight at night? And I think someone answered already. Well, someone already did. Kathy said, it's good. Ed said, no, right, Bill? No. The other one, I think I can answer because I was doing some investigation. Does the new 10% airplane tax apply to an advanced ultralight? I'm pretty sure it does if it's over $100,000 and it's less than three years old. So that's the, the interesting thing is if it's less than three years old and if it's over a hundred grand, unfortunately the cost is uh, for that aircraft will not only be your HST, but there'll be another 10% on the whole thing. Rick I haven't, P. Oh, sorry, forget. just a second. I haven't looked into this thoroughly, but my understanding is that tax applies for private use, not commercial, not positive. We'll have to look at that. And I thought it was for new airplanes. I didn't think it applied to used ones. Yeah. So, so. basically the law is it's got to be commercial use. I mean, it can't be private. That's uh, a premise. can't be commercial use um, or primarily used for business transportation, um, shuttling people, executives, one place, the other. And I think that the cutoff is three years. So it applies to aircraft that are less than three years old. And I did a lot of studying on this. Not that I was going to buy anything over $100,000. Let me make that perfectly clear. Um, you can't buy the... You can't buy the airframe today and then have them bill you for the engine, I think, six months. I think you have to wait like six months or a year for the modification. They, they buttoned it down really well so that you can't easily get around it. So um, does this apply then to used airplanes? So it applies to aircraft with, built within the last three years. And I think that that date continues to move up as the calendar moves up. But okay? is that new or resold, used? I think it's a manufactured. So I think it's like manufactured. Now the exact data, I don't have the legislation in front of me. You can check it. It's it's pretty it's pretty clear. Okay. But I it's, think it's, so it's like it's kind of like built after like uh, 2019 or something like that. So it's like about a three year window. So it's a, an older used airplane, but if it's got to be, it's got to be older than like three years older than the data manufacturer. Okay. So that didn't totally really answer my question. 
Okay. Whether it is a new purchase from a manufacturer or a repurchase or a used purchase from as somebody long else. As, as long as it's a used, as long as the aircraft is more than three years old, I think it escapes. Okay. So there is, yeah, so there, there is there's a, some, there is a time yeah. factor on that. So basically the a used aircraft, so like a, I think like a 2015 aircraft built in 2015, bought new today, like bought, bought by a new owner, but it's a new to them used, old used airplane, seven, or hardly old used airplanes, seven years old. The tax is not applicable. It's like manufactured within the last, I think it's three years. And some of our advanced ultralights uh, fall into this category. Some of them get Absolutely. to be pretty expensive. Absolutely. Yep, 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 yep. Um, Paul K. You should be thinking skis right now, though. Pros and cons, adding amphibious floats to ultralights. Paul, it's winter. <laughs> Anyone want to touch on that? Amphib floats on ultralights? Pros and cons? Had a guy come in with a Rans S12 with the full Lotus in snow. <laughs> the best of both worlds. A lot of drag. <laughs> um, okay, so, so I mean, whatever. If, if I could, I mean, I'm an ultralight. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a float rated GA pilot and I'm an ultralight float non-float rated pilot because i don't need a float rating for my ultralight but i have a um i have a savage cub on uh, 1400 floats straight floats the issue that you have with um ultralights and um floats is it's a weight issue so if you're flying an advanced ultralight kathy will spank me if i get this number wrong i think it's like 1232 i'm not on the expert panel here but i think it's 1232 gross um pounds gross takeoff weight and the issue that you've got with adding floats is the floats are significantly heavier obviously than the wheel gear so um new weight and balance certainly recommended should be done so you understand exactly what the weight and that the balance is and then what we've learned with the savage cub is that i'm able to fly the savage cub on floats but i have to be very careful about my weight and balance so that i do not exceed the legal gross weight Unfortunately, in Canada, the issue that we face is uh, that we that the states doesn't face is that um, that same Savage Cub is flying as an LSA in the United States, which actually adds about another 100 pounds or so into its gross rate on wheels. And when it goes on floats, they add another 100 pounds or so gross weight. So notwithstanding, the aircraft has demonstrated its capability in the states. It's flying as an advanced ultralight here in Canada, which means I have to fly it legally, which means I've got to be balancing my load. I did some calculations. I had this dream of amphibious floats on the Savage Cub, but um, pretty much solo. So that is an issue, and that's something you've got to be very, very careful about with an ultralight aircraft. And you may say, oh, I see these guys flying in the States, but they're flying as an LSA, and there's over 200 pounds extra available on that gross weight that is just not available here in Canada. So it's a, that's a pretty important consideration. That The pro is you can go out of any lake and land on the runway, the con is you're going to be doing it alone. So um, something that I could uh, I can add uh, there. Um, Eric F, two-stroke engines, an additive to put into the gasoline to avoid fuel icing. Are you guys doing additives or things like that for um, for any of your two-strokes um, to avoid icing? Nothing no, more. I've never used I've never used additives um, for for the and in fact it you know that's one of those one of those argumentative things where some people like certain oils what whatever but it but from what I've always read that additives are not a great thing um, so I've always avoided them. Okay, if nothing else. Here's a question um, from Paul S. Flying an Aula, or I guess a basic ultra as well, do you use a similar landing technique for crosswind landing as in a GA airplane? He's given us an example. Cross control to keep the nose aligned with the runway. So there, you guys are all nodding. And what a, maybe we could do is we could tell Paul a little bit about not only yes, but are there other considerations um, with an ultralight being ultralight versus like, your daddy's bonanza, Bill. Yes, uh, you have to use all the same uh, cross controls. Uh, differences: lighter aircraft, slower speed. Uh, if you 
start taxiing too fast, you may unintentionally go flying. So you have to consider the speed. And uh, when you do intend to take off, well, you have to add power and make sure you're all straight and lined up at the runway. And then you have to go because uh, in between don't quite work on a light airplane. There's cross wind limits on the ultralights just as they are on GA airplanes. So. I do often get that question uh, about crosswind, you know, what are the limitations? And for the trikes, it's about 15 knot crosswind. Um, we approach it again, like we do, uh, you know, with, when there's a lot of turbulence, we approach with a lot of airspeed um, and flare quite a bit closer to the ground. It, it's it's sometimes really unnerving to GA pilots that so we're coming in so nose down uh, in a crosswind and then quickly flare it and, and then bleed off the speed close to the ground, one or two feet off the ground. Um, so the approach in the landing is quite different um, in a trike. I think the speed itself and how fast the ground comes up to you and it can be just, you know, difficult to, to master. Great. Well, the, same, the same applies to uh, uh, three access control. Okay. Um, Kathy, while you have up, while I have, I have you up, um, uh, Rick P. Um, sent me a, I'm getting spanked here a few times. Rick P. sent me a note and says, I'm slighted, Ted. You didn't ask one of my questions. Kathy, what kind of trike do you fly? I fly uh, an Air Creation uh, Skyper 912S, 100 horsepower, um, with a, a bionics wing, which is quite unusual. It's kind of a one-off. Um, and I'm glad you asked me that question because that's one of the things I really notice in transitional training is to get people that, uh, as, as you both mentioned in your first video, but with the trikes, I often get a lot of people that, that want to change the wing or, or show up with a different wing and a different engine and, and with floats. And I tell them, you know, before you jump into buying that aircraft, um, really, really see, you can find out the information from, from knowledgeable people that 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 wing matches that base matches that those floats because they fly totally different if they're coming from a different manufacturer and um and just you know the the auto conversions the how the engines uh, offset there's a there's a lot of factors to think about so i tell people before you jump in and buy something and then go looking for transitional training really do some training on what you think interests you and then go about the purchase a little further along Great. Actually, there was a question which um, which was directed uh, as well to you, um, Kathy Montgomery, although it's kind of a medical question. Um, and it was from um, uh, Ron. He's a trike pilot. Um, steps after a heart attack to get back into flying after finding him in great shape after two years since mishap. Now, we've had a lot of questions asking why medicals are taking a long time from transport. And there's a lot of stuff that's really kind of out of our purvey. And so I hope no one feels kind of slighted that I'm, I'm not diving into that because that's kind of not the focus that we've got here. But I mean, I did see Kathy kind of nod a little bit and I don't know if there's a comment that could be made, but I did want to touch on it because that did pop up again when uh, when Kathy Montgomery was there. After a heart attack, Kathy, have you got any experience at all about that? I don't know if we want to wade into medical Are stuff. You talking to, you're talking to me, Ted? Well, I was going to actually, it was no, Kathy, Kathy Lubitz was like, okay. Unless you unless you know the answer, I don't know. You know what? I You know, I'm not quite sure. Um, I get that quite often it put that question and um you know i, I again um i'm not i've noticed that uh, as everybody has that it's been months and months and months and you're not getting a medical back a self-declared medical back uh so you're unable to fly i'm not sure maybe kathy you could answer this because i have a question for you uh my solution to that would be would would go get the category three and you've got an instant stamp on your um license for 180 dollars <laughs> yeah um, the biggest issue is with the um, the initial issue of the Category 4, because you can't issue a student pilot permit until you have a Category 4 certificate in hand. Um, we've been in discussions, UPAC's been in discussions with Transport about this. They've acknowledged that things have slowed down a lot. They're working on it. Um, I guess we have to give them a chance to catch up. Uh, but before they even... Before they would even work on it, they have to acknowledge that there's a problem in the first place. So we're we've gotten there. We've covered it quite extensively in light flight over the last few months. 
Um, and the other issue is submitting it properly to transport, which now is by electronic means as opposed to paper. Um, so initial issue is different than a re reissue or a renewal because the renewal, you have to have a, um, a sticker in your book. So you have to wait for that. So what transport is saying is to, what is it? The 40 days, I think is the standard of service, but that's weekdays <laughs> um, and they're behind. So the suggestion is to apply as soon as possible, give them 60 days and that's 60 business days which is almost three months ahead of time, uh, which is hard for the PPG schools. So there's other discussions going on about them because the first flight on a powered paraglider is a solo flight. So three months to get a medical before you can issue a student permit, not acceptable. So um, UPAC's been working on that. Um, if I don't, if I could jump in again, I didn't really answer the guy's question though about the heart attack. So if he doesn't, he cannot sign the category four medical, then he just has to go see an aviation doctor. And in, in my experience, when, when different students have done that, it's really not that big of a problem, but they do have to jump through some hoops that are a little bit costly. So just so they're aware, they just go see an aviation doctor to set that up. So transport um, wants to make sure there's not going to be any sudden incapacitation. So once you prove to them that you have the condition under control, um, it's possible to get a license back. Uh, that applies to category three as well. Um, but like Kathy said, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops and maybe costly. Uh, and going to a category four medical is not an option once you've had an issue with your license or with your medical. So I'm gonna answer the, uh, the question as well. Um, that was because I decided that 10 years ago that PPG was for me and I've gone from like a fixed wing and my first flight for PPG actually put me, I think, into cardiac arrest, just letting you know. <laughs> um, pretty thrilling. And I don't know, um, I, I would probably get the same feeling flying with Kathy and the trike. I just, I've been flying three axis for so long for me to hop into a PPG. I, I, it started a whole a cardiac issue. No question about it for me. Um, been getting a number you are of you are being sarcastic aren't you i loved it i'm being sarcastic <laughs> it was breathtaking um it was uh yeah it was uh i'm being sarcastic really it was uh and i'm i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna tackle kathy this summer i think to go for uh to go for a flight um uh, now that's here's a here's a question here's a question though um it's winter time who's flying and, and and what are you doing for preparation? So maybe we can go a bit around the table. Kathy, what's happening in the wintertime for your three-axis fixed aircraft? It's parked. Don't fly a motor. You don't drive a motorcycle in the winter. I don't fly my wide open airplane in the winter. Um, admittedly, it's a snowmobile engine, but it's a little cold for me. Okay. I'm going to go around the table. So just jump in. First one that speaks gets uh, expanded on the screen. <laughs> Who's flying? I fly. Um, I don't like it when it's uh, too cold. So if it's minus 10 or below, uh, I won't fly. It's not the airplane can't fly, but the preparation, the pre-flight and post-flight, it uh, gets to my bones. I guess it's also a, simple, a similar issue as far as um, the aircraft is concerned, preheat, you know, you're making sure that you're doing all that kind of winter preparation that you normally would for, for a GA standpoint, right? Yes, yes. Um, Kathy Montgomery, are you parked or are you flying? Um, you know, typically I am flying. Um, as I've gotten older, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as keen to do that. But, uh, you know, heated mitts. Uh, I have a heated car seat on my trike. Uh, I don't have the heated vest, but I dress snowmobile boots. And yes. Uh, winter flying. Um, I see there's on this uh, people sending questions in and some of my Quebec friends, crazy winter flyers, minus 21, minus 23, open air trikes all the time. So it does happen. I just uh, am getting a little old for that, but I do like it. You know, you're the last one up. You're going to answer. Are you flying? Derek? Yes, I do. I do. Not, not as often as, as I fly during the summer or, or, or warm uh, months, but totally doable. The problem is, uh, as Kathy said, you have to bundle up, heated everything, 
uh, slightly diff difficult, difficult to run in this kind of setup because we, we do foot lunch. Uh, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the air is smooth. Um, you know, it takes a, it takes a, it takes a bit of character to fly on the part parachute, but it's totally doable. Fantastic. Um, we're at the end of our time. Um, and I think it's been quite a nice little ride. What I'd like to do is I'd like to go around the table and basically any final comments that, um, that you may, uh, want to provide. And while you formulate that, so I won't surprise you, um, and I'll let you sort of go kind of a one at a, like a one at a time on that. I will tell you that um, if you sent your questions in um, by email, um, I'm not sure if I've got, and I didn't get to them. I got to most of them. Um, I'm not certain if I've got the contact information to be able to have them responded to. And unfortunately, um, everything that I've got um, on the actual chat window, I don't know if I can respond to them. What I might suggest is this, we're going to put the contact information for everyone up on the screen and oh, pardon me on the in chat and uh so if you want to sort of reformat those questions and direct them to the individuals then you've got the ability to do that i see derek's already answered perry's question about skis for ppg are, are, are those skis on your feet by the way um or are those skis on uh on a cart uh both you can you can you can you can take off with your with your skis like like normally would you you know like if you go into the to a hill then you can you can take off that way not from a hill I'm 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 talking you know on the ground uh, it is a it is a it gets fairly advanced like it requires a bit of uh, a bit of skill to to do that because there's another element to that needs to get managed which yeah you know take on foot is is quite difficult on its own but if you add skis to it it gets even to more difficulty. But it's totally possible. In in winter, uh, countless pilots they 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 transition over to little trikes and where they have skis on and and just and just fly that way. So I guess it's like getting off a ski lift when you were actually going downhill skiing. You got to make sure that you keep your tips up, right? <laughs> right. Unless you keep those tips up. And for that, you don't need a motor. You you can you can just go without the motor. <laughs> so Derek, any final comments? While we've got you up on screen. Um, well, there was a lot of questions that were that were asked regarding PPG. They we didn't have a chance to answer, so please 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 feel free to to send them by by email to me. I'm happy to 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 answer those questions. Uh, there was one interesting question regarding uh, collision that happened between the Cessna and powered paraglider in Florida, uh, in Texas. In the side, an article to Light Flight uh, about that, and uh, you know, so if you're not a UPAC member, please join and. You're gonna get full answer with 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 my best analysis. Um, other than that, yeah, info at paragliding.ca. That's uh, that's where you can send your. Email. I'll I'll answer to my best ability. Kathy Montgomery, any comments, last thoughts uh, to uh, our group that have assembled here? So yeah, um, for sure, I'd love to answer any questions. I prefer um, phone call, and I'll get back to you, answer all your questions, um, and. I just want to mention one more time that, that you know, as you, you guys did in your video, trans, uh, training, transitional training can be very easy. Um, I, I just keep, you can't overemphasize to make sure you go and get the right training, hopefully from somebody with a lot of experience in as close a machine as you're going to fly. Um, if it's a single seater, try and get somebody to teach you in something that weighs the same or is very similar. Um, but do spend the time, um, do the research online, as, learn as much as you can about the engines, um, and then do get the transitional training because it's a huge. It, it's just, it's just, it's just really needed. Billy, well, I agree. I agree with everything Kathy just said. Um, I don't think I can add any more to that. Okay, and then, um, President. Madam President of UPAC, final thoughts. Oh, and my and my and my co-host for the original video. Okay, um, there's a few questions I can answer real quickly. I just went through them. Um, somebody asked about LSA in Canada and increased weights for ultralights. Not in the cards right now. Uh, they asked about no medical, like the driver's license medical in the states or basic med. 
not in the cards right now. The regulations require a medical certificate, period. Somebody asked about 103 in the States. Can a Canadian ultralight fly 103? Yes, because 103 does not require a license at all. So, and neither does the airplane have to be registered. And somebody else asked if a 550 Beaver can be spun. And yes, it has been spun. I have not done it. I get into incipient spins, but I know a couple pilots who have spun them. Um, again, all of this points out the importance of the transitioning and finding out as much as you can ahead of time so that you get to be aware of what you might expect and then be ready for it. Um, yeah, so uh, UPAC has a lot of information. Uh, like Derek said, we've been covering some of this stuff in the magazine and he's got some more information for next time. So I encourage you to join. COPA is a good organization as well, as is, I guess, RAA for the home builders. Um, we like everybody. It's it's not us versus them. It's all us, uh, all of aviation. And a lot of the comments, suggestions apply to all types of airplanes, um, GA certified, uncertified, whatever. So I had a lot of fun, Ted, did you? Oh, I had a pretty good time. Absolutely. It was great to get all you folks together. Hopefully we can do this again. Maybe um, it seems to be there's a lot of interest. I certainly think that folks are looking at ultralight aircraft like they've never looked at before. It's one of the largest, it's probably like the growth um, uh, aircraft in Canada lately. And it's no reason, I mean, obviously why uh, the, the variety of aircraft that are available and they're all fun, all fun flyers. Um, and they are, uh, to a certain degree, less expensive. No one should think that flying is cheap. It certainly isn't. I mean, any recreational isn't. But the key is, I think, um, like Kathy, we said, these are fun flyers, and this is kind of what it's all about. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out to um, to do this. Um, I'd like to thank the, wow, almost 300 people that have joined us today. COPA to give the platform. And um, also when uh, um, on the chat window, take a look for our contact information. If you'd like to send us any notes and also in the contact, you'll see um, a really cool little app that I think Sharon's going to promote that um, uh, Kevin Brown has put together, which is a cool little maintenance app. So I want to draw your attention to that rather than just have it come up in the chat and go. Cause I, it's a, I mean, it's something cool that you should maybe look at. Thank you all our panel. Thank you for joining us. And thank you uh, all, all the COPA members and non COPA members. Great reason to join COPA. If you're not already a member, this is the kind of stuff COPA does. Um, it's been fun. And now for those of us that are out flying in the winter time, me, I'm going to take the rest of the afternoon off and we're going flying. Thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.